Hello, my name is Pastor Daniel Mesa. I am so blessed to having been invited to the 2020 West Virginia Camp Meeting at Smyrna Gospel Ministries. I'm really thankful for being here, and I'm really actually quite excited to be able to speak alongside people like Michael Brown, Michael Woodward, Irina Raylan, we have Jean-Claude Bolot, and Onika Holt, and Robert Motzinger, Alan Stump, Linford Beachy, um, S.T. Lewis, myself, Dr. Glenn Waite, Alan Stump, uh, Martin Barlow, David Sims, and have been really blessed to say yes, I would like to be involved. And uh, we get to have this opportunity to use technology, which is something I love. And I'm really excited to having been invited here. So I'm thankful for this, asking for God's blessings on all that we're doing. And I really look forward to the messages that we will be hearing. I'm recording this previously because my internet is a little bit slow and I can't get good quality video outside my internet connection or through my internet connection. So I'm going to add, take the opportunity to pray. So if you would like to kneel with me, I'd really appreciate it. And we'll ask God's blessings on this time that we have together during this camp meeting. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to meet together. Thank you for technology. In this crazy world, you have still allowed us to be able to meet in such ways whereby we can share the faith, we can encourage one another, we can see what it is that the, you have been leading each of us to and through in your holy word, and we ask that you would bless us. Please help us to understand what it is that your spirit has said to the churches, I do pray that you would uh, bless my tongue, that I can speak the words of your Son as he spoke your words. Help us to be encouraged, and may we be transformed as a result of being together for this time. We thank you and praise you for everything you've given in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I'm very grateful to having been invited to this camp meeting. So the subject is the shadow of the Almighty. And I've taken the opportunity to read that verse, Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that is a verse that even early on as a Christian, I memorized. You know, a lot of us have memorized Psalm 91, and we've come to an understanding that God has blessed those that honor Him and follow Him. So we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> see that the word shadow, I did a little quick search on that. The Hebrew word for shadow is actually used 49 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. And so I went ahead and looked through those and the majority of those shadow references or the uses of those words are translated in two different ways. You can see that Genesis 19 verse 8, when it said, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. That's a little hard for me to understand in this story because it's like, you can take my daughters, but I'm taking care of these men because they wanted protection. So the word shadow there is actually relaying to the idea of protection. Well. Wouldn't the daughters need protection too? So, you know, I'm going to have some questions for Lot when I get up into heaven. But the idea that the verse is used or the word shadow is used in context of protection is pretty interesting. But also there's another use of it. In Numbers 14 verse 9, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, Fear them not. And so the shadow of somebody's roof, actually casting an actual shadow because it's blocking the sun, is one of the ways it's used. But it's also in light of pr protection in that regard, protection from the sun. Then you have here this other reference in Numbers 14, verse 9, where it's talking about the defense. Okay, so it's translated shadow or defense. Now the Hebrew word for shadow being translated this way, it simply means to cast a shadow or for protection. You can see actually one of the shadows cast by a sundial in 2 Kings 20 verses 8 through 11. I'm not going to read it now just for time's sake, but uh, imagine 
the protection that God gives us from the sun. It reminds me of a story I heard years ago. It was of a young Indian man. He was a boy still, but he was coming of age to be a warrior. And so one of the tests that his father, which was the chief, had laid out for all young men was that they must go first out of the tribe into the woods alone for an entire night. Each young man at his own time must put a covering over his eyes and sit in the darkness all night long without taking the headdress off. It was a test of loyalty and a test of courage. Well, the young man did as he was instructed. Of course, it was a long night for that young man. As he had been told when the morning was rising to lighten or warm his face, he took off the blindfold. He immediately saw his father, the chief, standing a stone's throw away, watching to be sure that his son was safe. You can't imagine that his father was casting a shadow over that son in this illustration story, but you know that his father was near enough to know that his son was protected. So that's what I like to think about when I read that, that verse, under the shadow of the Almighty. We can be safe knowing that our father even when we are sometimes afraid, sometimes alone, it's very dark outside, we can still believe that we are safe and protected by our Father which is in heaven. We're going to look at that idea today to try to understand what it is that the Almighty is keeping us uh, and how the Almighty is keeping us. So notice what it says there in Psalm 91 verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Of course, we could confidently say that same thing as David did because we know that we have a God that loves us and he is our refuge, our fortress, and we can trust in him just like he expects us to trust in him as a loving father that can and will protect us. So he will deliver us from the things that are coming in the future. It's not going to be easy for any of us. We know that. It wasn't easy for the three young Hebrews. It wasn't easy for Elijah. It wasn't easy for Abel. It wasn't easy for the 120 that were in the room, upper room, that were afraid. But God blessed them because of their faith in him. Notice as we read a little bit further, Psalm 91 verse 3, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. So who is this fowler? The Hebrew word only occurs three times. And the other two uses are going to be right here as we notice. It says, Proverbs 6, 5 and Jeremiah 5, 26. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter. So that word hunter is important there. As a bird from the hand of the fowler. So you're going to be delivered from the hunter. You're going to be delivered from the hand of the fowler. So the hunter and the fowler are a little bit similar here in this verse, but notice verse uh, 26 of Jeremiah 5. Among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. Again, the same word as fowler. They set a trap. They catch men. Just like the Babylonian kingdom was condemned for catching men and deceiving men and destroying those that were here on this earth. It's the same idea. These snares are set, or this fowler is setting traps for men. So it must be that Satan and his agents are referred to, no doubt, by this word fowler, or the one that catches us as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so as we continue on here in Psalm 91, it, notice verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. I really like that one because, remember, the shield is the defense, while the buckler is for the offense. And so, if you know anything about the Roman um, attire that they would wear during their warfares, one of the things they would hold was a shield. Now, many times the shield was very heavy and very big. The reason being is they wanted to hide behind it. It was for the offense. When they are attacking, you can hide behind your shield. The buckler, on the other hand, was many times tied to the, the belt, and it could quickly be released. 
It was something that could be held in the hand, either left or right, depending on which, uh, which hand the sword was in, and you could quickly defray one of the oncoming tools of armor, whichever it was, whether it be a sword or a spear, or even somebody else's shield or their hand fist, whatever. You could uh, move that aside and go in for, well, we wouldn't want to do that, but the kill. And so the shield and the buckler here is described as the truth. The truth is what is important. The truth is how God protects us. That is how we are under his feathers, under his wings. We will trust being there, but it is with his shield and his buckler, which is his truth that is gonna protect us. So we can use his truth when we are on the offense and also when we are on the defense. And so I believe that his truth is so important for any of us to not only understand and share, but also to allow to transform our lives. The entire purpose of us being alive today at this time in Earth's history, right when everything is fulfilling so quickly, and it seems as though the prophecies will be able to be fulfilled rapidly, the major prophecies, the mark of the beast, the seal of God. We see that it's at that time that we must have, we must have underscore a Christian character that will stand through the trials of fire that the three Hebrews had to go through when they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Nothing but that which kept them bound was burned. They didn't even have the smell of fire on them or the smell of smoke. And so we know that we too can go through these trials in the future if in fact we have a faithful record as did Daniel and the three Hebrews. So Christ illustrated a similar idea of keeping us safe under his wings when he spoke to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Notice what it says. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he said in verse 37, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So think about that for a moment. A lot of people will say in response to you or me trying to teach that wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 through 30 is a reference to Christ being brought forth from the Father. They'll say, no, 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 no. Verses 1 through 22, it's using wisdom as a female. We can't confuse the female gender with a picture of Christ. Well, that's what Jesus just did right there. As a hen would have gathered her chicks under the wing, so would I have gathered you under my wing for protection. So Christ is here illustrating himself as a female illustration. Now, I'm not confusing gender. I am not encouraging that at all. That is not something that I think we should get involved in, but we can have an illustration referring to a female that represents Christ. For example, Eve represents Jesus Christ. The reason being is the Son of God was brought forth from the Father, just like Eve was brought forth from Adam. There are a lot of applications to that, but I just thought that was a really interesting point here in Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38 to help us understand a little bit better that the prophets can refer to a female illustration to represent a male. So I hope you appreciate that as much as I did. But the real question is, in this scenario, when it says, under his wings shalt thou trust, and he will cover thee with his feathers, Jesus says, I would cover you with my wings as a hen covers her chicks with her wings. Does God and Christ have wings? You know, I mean, oh, maybe. I've thought that through before. I've actually brought that question up before and to the offense of some, for sure. But remember John chapter 14, verse 9, it actually said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. What we're talking about specifically is Christ's nature, the characteristics of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These spirit characteristics that Christ was referring to, or that the Bible refers to in, in Galatians chapter 5, is what Christ was referring to. If the Father were, he didn't, but if he were to come to this earth and live as Christ did, you would have seen the same 
characteristics lived out by the Father as was lived out by the Son. So if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, you can go all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve, and you can ask the question, was Adam created in the image of God? You could say yes. Well, Adam didn't have wings. Neither did Eve. And Eve was brought forth to illustrate the Son of God that was brought forth from the Father. So even before sin, we could say, and after sin, we are in the image of God because we look like Adam, even though we are degenerated from 4, 000, uh, rather 6,000 years of sin. And so you could say that maybe God doesn't have wings based on how he created Adam and Eve. But notice something here for just a moment. Uh, speaking of the highest angel in heaven that was given the highest place of honor and glory, be, below the Father, of course, and below the Son, had not the Lord made the covering cherub, which was Lucifer at the time, so beautiful, so closely resembling his own image, had not God awarded him special honor? Had anything been left undone in the gift of beauty and power and honor? Then Satan might have had some excuse. And so we can see here that Lucifer was very much in the image of the Father, so closely resembling the image of the Father, because we know the Son was brought forth in the express image of his Father. There would be no excuse. Now, here, of course, Christ was the one that created all things, and it was the Father that created all things through Christ. You can see that in Hebrews 1 and also Ephesians 3, verse 9. But what we're seeing is that Jesus Christ brought forth this being, Lucifer, so closely resembling his own image. And does Lucifer have wings? Well, according to the Bible, in the sanctuary, you can see that on the mercy seat there were cherubim, and those cherubim had wings, two touching each other and two that were um, not, and I'm not sure if where they were, uh, but we do know that their faces were facing each other and they were also facing down toward the um, ark that had the Ten Commandments within them because the angels were interested with how man and how God would interact with the law that had been broken. So they have been interested in looking into the plan of salvation just as we are even looking at this study right now. So God may have wings, he may not, but we can see that it says in the Bible when Christ was prophesied as being on the cross, it actually says of the Father, notice, he bowed the heavens also and he came down. If you study this section of Psalm 18 verses 9, and onward, you'll realize it's the Father that's being referred to as coming down. Darkness was under his feet, just like darkness was above Christ when he was on the cross. And he, that would be the Father, rode upon a cherub, and he did fly. So according to this verse, how did he fly? He rode upon a cherub, which has wings. He did fly upon the wings of the wind. And angels, of course, are illustrated as wind, if you look at Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. Now, Psalm 18, verse 11, He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. So it's really interesting to me how you can see right there in the Bible that the Father is illustrated as flying because he's riding on a cherub. Now, I've said it in the past, can the Pope walk? And people have said, after a little bit of chuckle, of course he can walk. Well, yes, he can, but why doesn't he when he's being honored and taken in what's called the Pope Mobile or something like that? He is being honored and carried by those that are honoring him. And so could God fly? Probably. I'm not saying he can't. But why he's illustrated as riding upon the wings of the cherubim? and why he's illustrated as flying upon the wings of the wind, I'm not sure how to describe that. I just know that he could have wings, and he potentially could not have wings. I'm saying that. So, I want to say, when it says, under the shadow of his wings, or under the shadow of the Almighty, and under his wings shalt thou trust, it's to protect us from the fowler. Who is the fowler? Remember, the fowler is Satan. The fowler is the one as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
But my question is this then, if we can be under the shadow of the Almighty, does God Almighty, the Father, does he cast shadows? And does he really have wings? Whether he has wings or not, I'm not sure. Let's just say for this study that he, I'm not even going to say whether he does or does not. I'm just saying I'm not sure. But does he cast shadows? I can certainly say he does not. Notice what the Bible says in James chapter 1 and also John chapter 1. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. I I would imagine that's God the Father because through or as a result of him, all things were created through his Son. He is ultimately the Father. The lights in this case could definitely be the angels. So he is the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither is there a shadow of turning. In other words, God the Father can turn. But there's no shadow that's cast when he turns. Like if I were to turn this way or that way, there may be a shadow on my face because of the lighting in the room. But God is light. That's what John chapter 1 verse 5 says. You can see it here. God is light. And in him is no shadows, no darkness at all. And so if we're looking for God having the ability to cover us with his shadow... My question is, how does he do that? How does God cover us with his shadow if he is light? There must be some kind of object that he's using to cast a shadow in order for us to be under that shadow of the Almighty. And so, does he have a shadow? The answer is no. Does he have wings? Maybe. But for sure, he doesn't have a shadow because he is light. Okay? So after the terrors by night are described and the arrows that fly by day, God gives the promise to those that love him. Notice what it says in Psalm 91 a little bit further. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. So because you have done this, you have made the Lord, you have made him by choice, your refuge and your habitation, there shall No evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? For, because, this is how, he shall give his angels charge, most often translated command. He shall give his angels command concerning you, to keep you in all your ways. So wait a minute. The angels are the ones that are going to keep you in all your ways? Absolutely. The Bible says that God the Father, because you have loved him, because you have put His your trust in him, because you have made him your refuge and your habitation, he will cause no evil to befall you, nor any plague. How? For he will put his angels in charge of you. Imagine God the Father. He's in heaven, and all his commands come through the mediation of his son. So the father says, My son Daniel on the earth needs protection. Send an angel to my son. And so the Lord Jesus Christ gives a command to the angel. The angel says, Yes, sir! And he flies down swiftly to Daniel who needs his help. And that angel has been charged. He has been commissioned. He has been commanded to keep the words and commands of the Father. And so that angel, with all the strength that comes from the Almighty, he keeps Daniel in the way that Daniel has chosen. He keeps you in all your ways, the Bible says. And so notice as we continue on reading that again, for because he will give his angels charge concerning you or over you to keep you In all your ways, the ways that you have decided, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And so this scripture here has been very powerful to me. It's been very meaningful to know and understand that God is the one that is sending his angels to keep me in all my ways. My ways are not the ways that I used to have before I was a Christian. My ways then were all about sex and drugs and rock and roll, but I'm telling you, it's not that way this time. I have been transformed by the grace of God. 
that grace, by the way, is given by the inspiration of the angels. You can read that in Steps to Christ 52.2 and 52.3. Please make a note of that section and learn that the grace is the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit of Christ is given by the ministration of holy angels. And so I've been transformed by the grace of Christ, which also, of course, is in his word, for his word is spirit and life, according to John 6, verse 63. So we know that we can be transformed. My life is a testimony that I've been transformed by the grace of God. And ever since then, he has been keeping me in his ways through the ministration of holy angels, the holy angel that has been assigned to me. And so I really like these thoughts. But the question is, in, in Psalm 91, how are we under the shadow of the Almighty if he is light? Well, of course, he sends his angels to be guarding us, to keeping us in all our ways. And so do angels have shadows or do they cast shadows? Do they have wings? Most certainly. Whether God has wings or not, we know that the angels do. And so if you're under the shadow of the Almighty and you're protected under his wings, we know that that can be done in the context of the same psalm, Psalm 91, verses 10 and 11. He will keep us because he has given his angels charge over us. So notice, Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him to deliver them. So fearing God is what we are called to do in the first angel's message. And the angel of the Lord is the one that is sent to encamp round about those that honor God in light of the first angel's message. The first angel is followed by the second and the third. Notice what it says here. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Ellen White says in Psalm 34 verse 7. God commissions his angels to save. Did you see what that says? God commissions his angels to save his chosen ones from calamity, to guard them from the pestilence that walks in darkness, which would be that brought about by the enemy, Satan himself, and the destruction that wasteth at noonday, taken from Psalm 91 verse 6. Again and again have angels talked with men as... A man speaks with a friend and led them to places of security. Again and again have the encouraging words of angels renewed the drooping spirits of the faithful and carrying their minds above the things of the earth caused them to behold by faith the white robes, the crowns, the palm branches of victory which overcomers will receive when they surround the great white throne. It is the work of the angels to come close to the tried, to the suffering, to the tempted. They labor untiringly, they do not sleep, in behalf of those for whom Christ died. When sinners are led to give themselves to the Savior, angels bear the tidings heavenward. Now, why would that be, that they bear the tidings heavenward? Well, of course, because heaven needs to know. And there is great rejoicing among the heavenly host. The heavenly host includes not only the angels, but the Father and the Son. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. A report is born to heaven of every successful effort on our part to dispel the darkness and to spread abroad the knowledge of Christ. As the deed is recounted, where? Before the Father, joy thrills through all the heavenly host. I find that really challenging to the Trinitarian understanding of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I find here that angels are the ones that are going ascending and descending above, giving us the courage that we are called to have when we have faith in the Father and the Son, and we are protected under the shadow of the Almighty, getting protection under the wings of the Almighty as well. And so there are plenty of studies that are here in this uh, section of my website, Revelation with Daniel. You can simply search for, if you go to this option here, search for the term angels studies. If you wanted to see that a little bit bigger, 
you go to Angels Studies. If you were to search that, you could find this link here, which would take you to the section that I'm in, Angel Studies. And you'll find that there are lots of studies on the angels that are here. Some of these pages are many pages. Some of them are just two or three. So you could find plenty of studies on what the Lord has led me to understand about the angels. I wanted to read this quote here as I make it bigger. It's a pretty powerful quote. In the word of God are represented two contending parties that influence and control human agencies in our world. Constantly, these parties are working with every human being. Those who are under God's control through these contending parties, of course, the angels, those who are under God's control and who are influenced by heavenly angels will be able to discern the crafty workings of the unseen powers of darkness. Those who desire to be in harmony with the heavenly agencies, which are the angels, should be intensely in earnest to do God's will, keep his commandments. They must give no place whatever to Satan and his angels. And so I find that really a challenging quote. Challenging to the understanding of how we are to surrender ourselves to God and how, of course, we surrender ourselves to Satan. We could easily say, well, certainly we just listen to the angels of Satan and that's how we're influenced by him. Why can't we say the same about God? We listen to the influence of the angels. Because certainly, God gives his angels charge concerning you to keep you in the ways that his word, his spirit has taught you. And if you accept those words, God will keep you in those ways through the ministration of heavenly intelligences, angels. Every one of us having one of those beautiful and powerful angels. Now, I want to read another quote for you here that I find really inspiring. A guardian angel is appointed to every follower of Christ. He will give his angels charge or an appointment concerning you. These heavenly watchers shield the righteous from what? The power of other angels, the power of the wicked one. This Satan himself recognized when he said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hath not thou made an hedge about him and about his house, and about, about all that he hath on every side, from Job 1, verses 9 through 10, which we'll study in our next session? The agency by which God protects his people are presented in the words of the psalmist. So again, the agency is represented. What is the agency? The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivereth them. So the agency of God represents angelic ministry that will be able to take care of those that love him. That's in Psalm 34 verse 7. Said the Savior, speaking of those that believe in him, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, the children. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father. Okay, so my Father is where? My Father is in heaven. And so the angel, that was according to Matthew 18, verse 10, the angels appointed, charged, assigned to minister to the children of God have at all times access to his what? His presence. Wait a minute. In heaven is where my Father is. And the angels are always there, right? Beholding his face. And it is all times that they have access to his presence. Where is God's presence? God's presence is in heaven. How do we receive his presence? We receive his presence by the agencies that he has assigned, whether they be angels, whether they be his word, whether they be nature, or whether they be humans that are filled with his mind, his spirit, his character, his life. This is how God is ministering to his people through his presence. It is through his word, through his people, through his agents, whether they be angels or his word or nature. And so we find that God is very close to his people. That doesn't mean that God is in the flower, in the tree, in the human. No. God is by his spirit, by his mind, by his character, by his life in his people. And he uses angels, he uses humans, he uses nature, he uses his word to dispel that influence which is by his spirit, the influence of his spirit. I don't think that we can see God in the tree, in the rock, in the flower, in the leaf, those kind of things. Absolutely not. 
this is not what I'm saying at all. Neither am I saying that the angels or that the humans are the Holy Spirit. Neither is his word the Holy Spirit. Neither is nature the Holy Spirit. But what we do see is that God uses these tools of his in his agency to be able to disseminate or to be able to give the influence of his spirit. And we know that God is in heaven and he uses the ministering agents to be able to do that. So I find that really fascinating to be able to understand a little bit further how God is with us. He is with us through his word. In fact, let me read that with you as I turn to it now. I'm going to go to John, nope, Second John, chapter 1. The elect unto the elder lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. We could all say that to each other. I love you in the truth. If you honor the truth, I love you for honoring the truth. Not only I, but also they that have also known the truth. I love these people. The truth here is talking about the words that God has given through his son. What is not a lie? The truth. I love you in the truth and all them that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwells in us. How does the truth dwell in us? It dwells in our mind. We have chosen that truth. We memorize the truth. We keep that truth hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against him. So that truth dwells in us and that truth shall be with us forever. So Christ said, I am the word and I will dwell with you even to the end of the world. Grace be unto you, mercy and peace from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. And so the Father and the Son are in the truth. They are in love, just like we can be in the truth, as it says here, and we can love those that have known the truth. And so here in this section, we read about how the truth is with us and as a result of his word being spirit and life according to john 6 63 we can have that truth with us that truth is dwelling in us and no man can take that truth from us and so the spirit of god is with us through the influence of the agents that he has chosen well the influence of the spirit through the agents that he has chosen i find that a real challenge to the trinitarian understanding that i used to have as a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, by God's grace, I'm a minister doing the things that he has asked me to do in very many different places, but uh, he has also given me a little bit more freedom outside of that, what I was in before. When God needed most to protect his son from the enemy of all righteousness, how did he do it? What did God send? Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter four, a really potent story. It says, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, Desire of Ages, page 114, verse, uh, paragraph 2 says, When Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. Now, we can see in the context here what that could potentially mean. Notice as we continue reading in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, which is the divine nature, command that these stones be made bread, which is an appeal to the human nature. He answered and said, It is written, Man, the human nature, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, appealing to the divine nature. Then the devil takes him up, literally carries him, takes him up into the holy city. Because remember, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He wasn't very strong at this point. But the devil took him up into his hands. And he set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written in the Bible, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Oops. Satan forgot a little part, to keep thee in all thy ways. You see, because it wasn't Satan's desire to keep Christ in all his ways. Satan wasn't there to keep Christ in the ways that God had commanded him. So he just accidentally skipped that part. And he didn't quote that part, to keep thee in all thy ways. But it does say, In their hands they shall bear thee up, just like Satan actually carried Christ when he took him up into that holy city. So in their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Well, Jesus says, it is written, appealing again to the divine nature as he had done before, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up, carried him into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all kingdoms, all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, which was a false demonstration of the spirit of prophecy. Now, what do I mean a false demonstration? If you go and find Revelation 19, verse 10, you will see that the angel says to John, who is trying to worship him, no, 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 don't worship me, worship God. I am of your brethren, which have the testimony of Jesus. So wait a minute. The, the, the angel just said to John, I'm one of your brothers. I have the testimony of Jesus, just like you do. Wait, John is a prophet, and the angel is saying that he has the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. The angel was saying, I have the spirit of prophecy, just like you do. Don't worship me, the one that has the spirit of prophecy. I'm just sent by God to relay a message to you, and that's what I've been doing this whole time. That's why it says in Matthew, I'm, I'm sorry, Revelation, I'll read it to you. Revelation chapter uh, 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He sent his angel. That was the spirit of prophecy that was referred to right here when in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, also 22 verses 8 through 9, where the angel says to John, no, don't worship me. I am of your brethren, the prophets. So I'm one of your brothers that has the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. I'm one of your brothers that ha that's the, one of the prophets. Don't worship me. Worship God. And so we can see that Satan come to Christ or came to Christ as an angel that had a message from God. It was a false demonstration of the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, a false application of one of the prophets. Okay, He was trying to deceive Christ with something that Christ understood. Christ knew in the Old Testament that Daniel had been sent an angel. Christ knew that Jacob had been sent angels on that amazing vision of the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Christ knew that angels had been sent to Zechariah. Christ knew that angels had been sent to Isaiah to even touch his lips saying, your iniquity has been purged from you and your sin has been cleansed. God used an angel to do all those things. And so Satan knew that Christ understood that's what the Old Testament was about. So what did he do? Satan shows up as an angel with a message from God, a false demonstration of the spirit of prophecy. And so we can see here, and that was in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, now we're looking at verse 9. He said unto him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, referring to the Father, and him only shalt thou serve. And how do we serve God the Father and him only? Through his Son. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, how did God strengthen him? Angels came and ministered unto him. So it seems to me that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. How? Did the Spirit of God actually leave God and somehow go down as a ghost to lead Christ into the wilderness? No, the Spirit doesn't leave God because the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 26, I'll read it to you here. James chapter 2, verse 26, the body without the Spirit is what? Dead. So God doesn't separate from his Spirit. What we have is one of the angels, or many of the angels, being sent down to Christ. The Desire of Ages says Christ had two angels with him the entire time he was on this earth. And those angels giving the messages from God the Father on that ladder, which was Christ, they were ascending and descending, they were the ones that were able to give the words to the Son. This is what the Father says. We've ascended and descended upon the ladder, which is Christ's living experience as a human, something that hadn't been fulfilled yet, was, but was certainly there by promise. You know, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that Christ, the seed, will be able to crush the serpent's head. That was a promise. And based on the promise of God, which God cannot lie according to Titus, we can have this, this experience of Christ being that ladder 
without actually fulfilling yet the expectations that the Father had for him. It was based on God's word. So these angels, the ones that I believe led him into the, the wilderness, which the Bible can say the Spirit led him into the wilderness, because the word spirit and angel are synonymous. That's, of course, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, and also verse 14. But then at the end of this story, angels came and ministered unto Christ. So in this scenario where God really needed to protect his son, he needed to protect him from face-to-face -face combat with the enemy, what did he do? He sent angels to strengthen him. I think that is absolutely amazing. So notice also as we continue reading, Christ overcame Satan on every point. The wily foe could not induce him to swerve from his allegiance to the Father. Again, worship the Father, and him only shalt thou serve. Get thee behind me, Satan, Christ said, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The captain of our salvation overcame for us. Satan left the field a conquered foe. But the strain upon Christ left him as one dead. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Their arms encircled him. Upon the breast of the highest angel in heaven, which at this time is Gabriel, his head rested. Divine consolation flowed into his soul. How? By putting his head upon the breast of the highest angel in heaven. Divine consolation flowed into his soul. That doesn't make the angel divine. I've said it before. Because a human uses a tool, it doesn't make the tool human. And because God uses an angel in a divine way, it doesn't make the angel divine. But what we have here is God giving the divine consolation to the angel and commanding him to keep his son in all his ways. And so what happens? Divine consolation was given through that highest angel. Notice as we continue, the foe was vanquished. Humanity was placed on vantage ground. Christ had conquered. Those who became partakers of the divine nature would be able to resist the temptations of the enemy. And I want to be one of those. I want to be one of those who, are, who is a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do we do that according to Peter? Through those exceeding great and precious promises, through the word of God, which is spirit and life. And so I find that this, the words that God has given to his son, that he has given to us through the ministration of angels, as you can see in Re Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, to me, his words are so empowering, so inspiring. That's what keeps me, and as it says in Psalm 119, keeps young men from sinning against God, keeping their garments clean and pure. So now, when God needed his son to keep on keeping on right before his death, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did God do to strengthen him? Notice what it says in Matthew 26, 44. And he left them, that was Christ leaving the disciples, and went away again and prayed the third time. He had already prayed twice, saying the same words, Father, if it be possible. Notice what it says as we continue on in Luke twenty-two thirty-nine. He came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Remember, Matthew said three times, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And after, at, at this time, when he was praying three times for protection, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, doing what? Strengthening him. So when the father really needed his son to have strength and courage and the ability to withstand the attacks of the devil again, right at the end of his life, when he was really willing, ready to give up the entire experience, I don't want this, my father. I don't want this, but I want your will more than mine. When it came to that, the father sent angels to strengthen his son. I find that a great challenge against my previous Trinitarian thinking as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I don't think that way anymore. 
God uses his agents to do his will. It's amazing. And in Psalm 91, under the shadow of the Almighty, under his feathers where we find refuge, this is done by the ministration of holy angels. He will keep you from a thousand falling at your side and ten thousand at your other side. How? For he has given his angels charge concerning you to keep you in all his ways, all the ways that you have chosen. So under the protection and the command of angels is how we are under the shadow of the Almighty, under his wings. Notice as we continue reading in Psalm 91 verse 11 again, he shall give his angels charge, most often commanded or command, over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Even the babe in its mother's arms may dwell under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. So we are agents that cast a shadow for the Almighty. It is through the faith of the praying mother that our children can be under the shadow of the Almighty. So again, the mother here is one of the agents, just like one of the angels would be. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. And how was that? Of course, through his praying mother. If we will live in communion with God, we too may expect the divine spirit to mold our little ones, even from their earliest moments. The desire of ages 5.12. And then it goes on to say, quoting John 17, Thus in the language of one who has divine authority, Christ gives his elect church into the Father's arms. As a consecrated high priest, he intercedes for his people. As a faithful shepherd, he gathers his flock under the shadow of the Almighty, in the strong and sure refuge. For him, there waits the last battle with Satan, and he goes forth to meet it. So how does he do it? He sends his angels. I have seen the tender love that God has for his people, and it is very great. I saw angels. Okay, first, before we go on, I want to show you that I have seen, she says, the tender love that God has. Okay, and now she's going to express or explain this tender love. So the rest of this paragraph is an explanation of the tender love that God has for his people. And it is very great. What is this very great love? I saw angels over the saints with their wings spread about them the shadow of the Almighty, and under the wings shalt thou take refuge, right? Each saint had an attending angel. And if the saints wept through discouragement or were in danger, the angels that ever attended them would fly quickly upward to do what? To carry the tidings, and the angels in the city would cease to sing. Well, now remember, these angels fly upward to heaven, right? To carry the tidings and the angels in the city would cease to sing but then Jesus instead of being on the earth Jesus would do what he would commission another angel to descend and that angel would encourage it would watch over it would try to keep them from going out of the narrow path with they which they had already chosen but if those Saints did not take heed to the watchful care of these angels that God had sent, that Jesus had sent, and would not be, what's that word, comforted by them, but continued to go astray, the angels would look sad and weep. What would they do? They would, they would bear the tidings upward, and the angels in the city up in heaven would weep, and then with a loud voice they would say, Amen. But if the saints listened to the words of the angels, and they fixed their eyes upon the prize before them and glorified God by praising him, then the angels would bear the glad tidings to the city. And what would they do? The angels in the city would touch their golden harps and sing with a loud voice, Alleluia! And the heavenly arches would ring with their lovely songs. So we have here a clear description of the fact that when Children on earth are discouraged. Angels are sent to them. And they bring the tidings back up to heaven. They are ascending and descending upon the ladder, which is the Son of Man, the only mediator between God and men. And what does God do with this only mediator? He sends angels ascending and descending upon that mediator. And so what they do in heaven is they rejoice or they are discouraged. And so Jesus in heaven 
What will he do to encourage, to comfort, and to bless these people with strength? He will send another angel. These are messengers of light. These are messengers of truth. These are divine, heavenly agents. Not that the agents are divine, but they are divine because they have been given the divinity or the divine command from the Father and the Son to take what God gives us and deliver it. Therefore, they are a resource that God uses in his divine ministry for us. I'm going to read a little bit more here in this section. During these times where we have a need to be under the shadow of the Almighty, God has sent his angels to protect and bless us. Even during that time where it will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. See Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. Notice in Revelation 7 verse 2. I saw an angel ascending from the east. What was, what was he doing ascending? Ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels. To what? The angels. So there was an angel crying to the angels. To whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Revelation 7 verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So God is not referred to in the we. God is the one that's referred to as we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so you can see the same idea in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 1 where it continues on saying, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge, charge, yep, cause them that have charge or command over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughtering weapon in his hand. And one man among them, so one of the six, one of those men among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, and the glory of God, the God of Israel, was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man, clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry after the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. So in the time of trouble, just before the coming of Christ, the righteous will be preserved through the ministration of heaven and the angels. But there will be no security for the transgressor of God's law. Angels cannot then protect those who are disregarding one of the divine precepts. That is the end of the study. But I want you to understand, as I am starting to understand, we will be sealed by the ministration of holy angels. We will be protected in the time of trouble by the protection of holy angels. Psalm 91 says that we will be under the shadow of the Almighty, under the wings he will, we will take, uh, put our trust, because God has said, he will give command to his angels to keep us in all the ways that we have chosen. I am so encouraged by the words that God has given us in his holy scripture. Under his wings, under the shadow of the Almighty is where I want to be. And I want you to be there too. So please continue to study with me. Continue to pray for me. I'll pray for you. I'm so glad to be involved with this ministry along with all these other men where we can proclaim the truth as it is in his son, Jesus Christ. And to God, we will give the glory. Thank you so much for this time and God bless you. I look forward to answering some of your questions now as we take a little bit of time to consider what it is that I've said and what thoughts you might have in response. Mm -hmm.